So this morning's gospel lesson is the second in three parables. And we've been covering these three parables. We, we started last week with Pastor Mark talking about the tens bridesmaids. This week, obviously, we're, we're talking about this parable, the three servants. And then next week, Pastor Kevin's going to talk and address the, the parable of the sheep and the goats found in Matthew chapter 25. And these are the three parables that come like right at the end of our church year, talking about the fact of, of what Jesus was saying his, to his disciples about when he comes back, right? Because we know that he's going to die and rise and then ascend into heaven. And so he's telling his disciples, okay, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what it's supposed to look like. This is what it's supposed to do. And, and, and this is how you are to respond in the midst of that. This then is how you are supposed to act. And he, and he does this by way of parable. And, and really, 35 of Jesus' recorded sayings were parables. He used parables quite often. And, and he did this, and when he did this, he, he would focus on God and his kingdom. And in doing so, he would reveal of what kind of God he is, by what principles he works, and, and he would, what God expects of humanity. Now, we have to realize that when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, right, he's not just talking about some far off place, right, some, some place that we're waiting to go when we die, but he's also talking about the, the rule and the reign of God here and now. So when we read parables, we, we need to keep some things in mind. The, the first is this, ready? The Bible, it's not about you. The Bible is God's revealed word to us about him. And so whenever we read scripture, a lot of times our first inkling is to say, well, well then how does this apply to me? Like, what, what should I do in this? And, and what we should be doing is kind of saying, well, what is this revealing about the now and the not yet of the kingdom of heaven? What is this revealing about the kingdom of heaven? And what is this saying about who God is and how he works. And then once we look through those things, then we can say, well, now how are we called to respond to what he's already done or is doing? And so this particular parable opens up and Jesus is talking about a, a master who calls his servants in because he's, a, he's about to go on a trip. Now, if you have your Bible open, because all good Lutherans bring their Bibles to church and open them, right? That's kind of a tongue-in-cheek joke. Uh, a lot of times Lutherans forget their Bibles or whatever. But if you had your Bible or your phone open up to this, you would, you would see Matthew 25, right? The, the three parables that we're studying. And in, in Matthew 26, something happens. Jesus is arrested. In Matthew 27, what happens after he's arrested? He... Oh, by the way, I'm going to ask questions. I'm looking for a response, right? <laughs> After arrested, he's tried, and then he's, he's crucified. And then in Matthew 28, what happens? Christ is risen. See, I'm a responsive preacher. Yeah. And then he ascends into heaven, right? That's where we get the, the great commission, right? All anxiety, all anxiety, no, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given. He takes our anxiety, but, but he doesn't give it back to us, right? So, so if, if you're thinking about the fact that chronologically 25 is, is right before 26, 27, and 28, then, then maybe who is, a rep, who is this master in the parable representing? Jesus, right? The, the master is going on a trip. He brings his servants in, and, and he, he entrusts them things. Now, why did this master bring his servants in? Well, who was going to be about the business of the master while he's gone? The servants were, right? I mean, who, who was going to, to make sure that ke stuff kept going, right? That it didn't just stop once he leaves. So who do you think maybe the servants are representing? Believers, right? But believers in Christ, followers of Christ, his disciples, you know, you and me. And what does he entrust them? What does he give to them? 
He gives them money, right? Now here's the deal. I, I like the God's word version except for things like in this parable, right? Because uh, the, the word there in scripture, the, the Greek word is talent. And, and, um, and so what God's word version does is it tries to kind of put talent into today's terminology, right? And so it says, well, you know, he went away and he gave them 10,000 and 4,000 and 2,000. And, and there might be some of us in here sitting and going, $10,000, that's a lot of money, right? And there might be some of us sitting here going, $10,000, that's how much I spent on my meal last night. If that's you, by the way, I'd love to go to dinner. <laughs> so really, let's put it in actual contextual terms. A, a, a talent was about 20 years of wages. And if you, if you really stop and think, a, a year of wages in that time was about 50 bucks. And that's if you're doing good. Now, 50 bucks for dinner, you spend that, you know, no problem, especially if there's a couple of you, right? So, so really what the master is entrusting them with is the first guy is entrusting with 200 years worth of wages. The second one is 90, or 80 years worth of wages, and the third is 40 years worth of wages. Does that change things a little bit when you're reading it, right? Hey, I'm going to give you 200 years of wages, I mean, that's, that's not just a lot of money. That's an extravagant amount of money. And it's not like this master was like, I'm giving you all of my money. I'm dividing it in these ways. No, he was like, hey, here, here's the deal. Here's some fun money while I'm gone, right? 200 years worth of wages, you know? Uh, uh, you, know I, you, you can do 40, you know, 40 years. You, you, you can do 20, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's giving them this. He's entrusting them this out of, the, out of his abundance, it's not like he's hurting for money when he's done, right? I mean, he still goes on a long trip. I don't know about you, but I've never been on a free vacation. You know, even if you win something, you still got to pay taxes on it, right? And so, I mean, this is an extravagant amount of money that this man is handing his servants, and you know it's out of his abundance. So, so what is this parable telling us about the master Jesus thus far? Well, first of all, he has abundantly more than we can ever ask or imagine. To give the servants this type of money and not even bat an eye, that, that means he's got to have way more than we can ever even think or dream of. And not just that, but, but he knew he was going to leave, and so he invites his servants in. He, he loves his servants enough to invite them in and, and to care for them, to make sure that they are taken care of, and, and to bestow gifts of them uh, according to their ability to do the work that they need to do while he's gone. He doesn't say to them, hey guys, I'm going on a trip. Good luck. See you later, right? You, you got this. You got nothing, but you got this, right? No, he bestows on them all the gifts that they're going to need in order to do the work and, and so much more. And the third thing is, is there's an expectation here that when he leaves, are the servants going to do the work? That's the expectation, right? They're going to do the work. They're not just going to sit there and twirl their thumbs and go, man, I hope he comes back soon, right? They're going to do the work. You see, regardless of how much he gave his servants, his, des his desire was that his servants would do work while he's gone, that they, would in that they would use what's entrusted to them and invest that and see what might happen. He he's bestowing on them this great honor, this great responsibility out of his great love for them. He's not expecting them to just like stick their heads in their ground, to, to twiddle their thumbs. He's calling them to invest what he gave to them. He's calling them to do work. Now, if you grew up in the Lutheran church for any amount of time, right there you might be like, you just used a four-letter word, pastor. Work, right? Isn't it by grace you've been saved through faith? This is not of your work so that no man may boast. Yes and Amen. You and I are saved by grace through faith. The faith that God has given to us, the faith that he has lavishly poured upon us, that is what saves us apart from our works. At the same time, 
As Lutherans, we also teach that faith should yield good fruit and good works, that such a person must do such good works as God has commanded for the sake, but not place their trust in them and thereby earning grace before God. By the way, that's from the Augsburg Confession, if you're wondering, which is a, you know, the book of what we believe, teach, and confess, Article 6. Luther talks about the, the, uh, the meaning of the petition, thy kingdom come. He says this, God's kingdom comes when our heavenly Father gives us his Holy Spirit so that by his grace we believe his holy word and we lead godly lives as a result of that here in time and there in eternity. You see, in this parable, Jesus is teaching that he has entrusted believers with all great things, with all the grace and the mercy and the peace and the gifts that he has given us, and he calls us then to steward those by doing work, to believing in the gospel that he has given us freely, and then after he ascended to actually do the master's business. So what's the master's business, right? Got to ask that question. Well, in Luke 19, he says, the son of man has come to seek and to save people who are lost. In Matthew 20, he says, the son of man didn't come so that others could serve him. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many people. You see, we know that that Jesus came calling people to repentance and telling them that through faith in him, they can be reconciled with the Father. Through his life, his death, and his resurrection, they could be saved. He did this by coming to earth and not telling everyone, you need to serve me because I'm the king of the universe. But no, he came as a servant and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. He lived a life of service to those around him. And he did this because... He loves us. He did this because he is merciful and gracious. And so we as his followers are called to to rest in that message, to live into that message, and to live out that message as well, that message of hope, of mercy, of grace, of forgiveness in the places where we live, learn, labor, and laugh. We're not called to just stick our head in the sand and do nothing until Jesus returns to ignore the fact that that he has called us to do work and and work around us in his name and for his glory. You see, we're called to invest the gifts that he has so abundantly given us in others around us and and to watch what he does in and through that investment. The first two servants, they got that, right? They invested what their master gave to them. They, they were all about their master's business. They, they were excited upon his return because, because of what that investment had done, right? They were, they were giddy. They were like, oh, the master's coming back. The master's coming. It's kind of like a new husband that like, you know, when his wife leaves, he cleans the whole house. And when she comes back, he's like, hey, babe, babe, I did something. Look, I did something, right? That was me, by the way. Uh, you know, or a little kid that, that when their mom or dad comes back, they're like, look, look at what happened. Look at what I got. And what was the master's response? It was the exact same response to both of those servants. Good job. You're a good and faithful servant. You proved that you could be trusted with a small amount. I'm going to put you in charge of a large amount. Come and share in your master's happiness. The fact of the amount that the servants received from their investment, that wasn't what was rewarded, was it? He didn't say, great job, you doubled your money. Now come and receive your master's happiness. No, it wasn't about what they earned. Because the reality is they would have never earned enough. Rather, it was the fact that they put the investment to work. That was what was celebrated the first, two, uh, the first two servants accepted their calling and did something to invest the gifts that they were given to further the kingdom of God as their master was gone. They, they believed their master loved them. They, they believed their master was gracious and, and that he had entrusted them with this gift. And, and as a result of what they did, they were, the master said, hey man, come and share in my happiness. Come and share in all of my wealth and abundance with me. 
Do you think the master would have acted the same way if their investments would have yielded just 1%? If they would have just got a pence? If they would have just like, you know, done one little thing and said, hey, look, I got one penny more than what you gave me. Yes or no? Yeah. And you, well, how do you know that? Well, when he looks at the third servant who says, I just buried your money and did nothing with it. He said, you should have invested my money with the bankers. When I returned, I would have at least received my money back with interest. He just wanted them to do something with what they had been given. But what about that third servant? What about the guy who basically stuck his head in the ground and did nothing? He didn't believe that his master was full of grace, did he? He didn't believe that he was full of mercy, did he? Rather, he believed his master was a very hard person to please. The third servant lived out of, out of fear, without love. He believed that, that his master was a dangerous person and there really was no pleasing him. And so he tried to earn his master's favor. He, he did what he thought his master expected him to do. And he said, well, here's your money back. Obviously, his plan backfired and he was kicked out of the kingdom altogether. You see, friends, Jesus is coming back someday. And he's entrusted us with with all of our time, our talents, our treasures, his grace and his mercy to steward while we're waiting. What are you going to do with it? Now, remember that this parable has nothing to do with being faithful enough. Rather, it causes us to wrestle with the questions, who do I believe God to be? This angry taskmaster waiting to smack me every time I turn around? or good and gracious God who loves me? How am I going to respond with the things that he's given me to steward? Am I going to cower in fear, or am I going to invest out of the abundance of what I've been given? Now, as sinful humans, we constantly struggle with what to do with the things God's entrusted us. Well, let me put that a different way. I don't want to project. I constantly struggle with the things that God has entrusted me. I know you guys do it perfectly. You never get anything wrong. I mean, there's so many things that pull at us in so many different directions, aren't there? So many things that say, look at me, invest in me, right? And, and I don't know about you, but there are so many times I get it wrong. There are so many times I, I look to invest in my kingdom, in my glory, in my honor, and for praise for myself rather than what God has given me for the sake of his kingdom. I, I want returns for me, not always for God. And so I thank God for his extravagant mercy. I thank God that he is a loving God full of grace and forgiveness. And he has shown that in the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus. I thank God that he has and will continue to forgive me for Jesus' sake. Through faith in Jesus, you and I are forgiven. I thank God that as we come to the rail this morning, as we come up for communion, he literally gives us his body and blood in, with, and under the bread and the wine. He says, hey, you struggle? Awesome. Here's the medicine for your soul. Take and eat. Take and drink. Now let me lead you and guide you. You see, really every morning we, we, we should be waking up and praying, Lord, lead me to use this day and all that comes with it for your glory. Lord, show me how and where you're calling me to invest your gifts for your kingdom. And as we wrestle with how to best invest what's been entrusted to us, May we know that God has given us his spirit. And his spirit will constantly guide us and point us to him. May we remember every day that we're loved and we're forgiven for free. May we wake up remembering our baptism the day that the Lord has put his name upon us and called us his own. And may we seek the spirit to lead us and guide us, to strengthen us, to encourage us and ensure us that we are His. We are loved by Him. 
And when He does return, may He find us willing to serve Him in everything, and may we live in the confidence and the hopeful anticipation of the day when He does return. Amen?